The year is 1873, and in the quiet solitude of his study, James Clerk Maxwell is just finishing the final stroke of what would later be deemed his four equations of electromagnetism. These elegant mathematical expressions would forever transform our understanding of the fundamental forces governing our universe. With an air of excitement and a hint of trepidation, Maxwell's pen glides across the parchment, etching the secrets of nature onto the fabric of scientific knowledge. In these four equations, Maxwell distilled the essence of light, electricity and magnetism, unifying them into a sublime framework. Let us delve deeper into these eternal equations, for they hold the key to unlocking a realm where the fabric of space-time itself is torn asunder. The enigmatic domain of black holes. The first equation, Gauss's law for electricity, reveals the relationship between electric charges and the electric fields they generate. It states that the total electric flux through any closed surface is proportional to the total charge enclosed within. The second equation, Gauss's law for magnetism, exposes the connection between magnetic fields and the absence of magnetic monopoles. It states that the total magnetic flux through any closed surface is always zero. Faraday's law for electromagnetic induction, the third equation, demonstrates how a changing magnetic field induces an electric field. It states that the electromotive force, or EMF, around a closed loop is equal to the negative rate of change of magnetic flux through the loop. The fourth equation, Ampere's law with Maxwell's addition, unifies electric currents and changing magnetic fields. It states that the circulation of the magnetic field around a closed loop is directly proportional to the total electric current passing through the loop, including the displacement current that arises from changing electric fields. Intriguingly, these last two equations, Faraday's law and Ampere's law with Maxwell's addition, hold within them a profound revelation. They form the electromagnetic wave equation. Through meticulous calculations, Maxwell deduces that the mutually reinforced electric and magnetic field oscillations are the two components of an electromagnetic wave, which spreads through space at a certain speed, defined by the electric and magnetic field constants. That speed, embedded in these equations, is none other than the speed of light, denoted as c. The unexpected interplay between Maxwell's equations and the speed of light acted as a profound catalyst for Einstein's theories of relativity. His special theory of relativity, inspired by the unchanging nature of light's velocity, revolutionized our comprehension of space, time and motion. Expanding on this foundation, Einstein constructed the general theory of relativity, which portrayed gravity as the curvature of space-time due to the presence of matter and energy. Within this framework, the predictions of black holes emerged as extraordinarily dense and compact entities, possessing an intense gravitational force from which even light cannot escape. Exploring the intricate aspects of general relativity enables us to unravel the captivating phenomena residing within the domain of black holes. We shall begin with the construction of a three-dimensional flat Euclidean space. Every space has something called a metric, that is, a way to measure distances in that particular space. In the case of the flat Euclidean space, the metric comes from the Pythagorean theorem. More precisely, it says that the square of an infinitesimal displacement ds is equal to the sum of the squares of the infinitesimal displacements in each of the coordinates x, y and z. Let's now add the fourth dimension of time, parametrized by c, so that all of our coordinates are in the same units. To adjust the metric of this now called flat Minkowski space or space-time, we shall not add but subtract the time coordinate from the equation. This is the fundamental difference between space and time. The time coordinate has an opposite sign. But the metric that we have now is still for a flat space-time. We want to know how does this generalize to a metric for a curved space-time. If we label each of our coordinates, x0, x1, x2 and x3 respectively, we can say that the square of an infinitesimal displacement ds is equal to the sum of all possible products of two coordinates, where each term in the sum is factored by a certain number called g. Represented in tensor notation, we have the following equation. We can also get rid of the sigma here, because Einstein decided it's too much of a drag to write it every time. 
The 4x4 tensor G in this equation is called the metric tensor. It is the fundamental tensor in general relativity, as it tells us how to measure distances in an arbitrarily curved spacetime. For the case where the curvature is zero everywhere in our coordinate system, the metric tensor has the following values, and the whole equation reduces to that for a flat Minkowski spacetime. If, however, the metric tensor deviates from that at different points in our coordinate system, we may want to consider the derivatives of the metric tensor with respect to the coordinates in order to obtain the so-called Christoffel symbols. A Christoffel symbol consists of the derivatives of the basis vectors with respect to each of the coordinates. These derivatives are themselves vectors with a number of components equal to the number of coordinates. Hence, we need three indices to represent a Christoffel symbol one for the component of the resultant vector, one for the basis vector we are differentiating, and one for the coordinate with respect to which we are differentiating it. Using the Christoffel symbols, we can then obtain the Riemann curvature tensor, which can be reduced by a trace to a simpler form, the Ricci curvature tensor. The Ricci tensor represents the change in the volume as it moves across a curved spacetime. We can further reduce that to the Ricci scalar, which is a single number representing the volume change across a perfectly symmetrical but curved spacetime. I want you to keep these ideas in mind as we move to the other piece of the puzzle that is general relativity. We want to imagine the amount of matter in motion, or momentum flux, through the 4D manifold that is spacetime. This momentum has four components and it can go through a 4D region where any one of the four coordinates is held constant. This gives us a 4x4 tensor with one index representing the component of momentum and the other the coordinate which is held constant. The first row represents the energy of the system and the first column represents the flux through space at a constant time, which is the density of the system. As the flux in one row changes, the density in that row should also change by an equal and opposite amount. We can express this by saying that the sum of the partial derivatives of the flux and the density with respect to the coordinates is zero, and therefore the divergence of this tensor is zero. Energy and momentum are conserved. The tensor I've just described is called the energy-momentum tensor, and it is part of the right side of the famous Einstein field equation for the gravitational field. The left side is the Ricci tensor minus one-half the Ricci scalar multiplied by the metric, which also has a divergence of zero. The constant expression in the right side represents the stiffness of spacetime. We can denote it by kappa, and we can denote the left side with a single tensor, g. This is the simplest form of the Einstein field equation, and it summarizes all of general relativity in a single expression. Matter tells spacetime how to curve, and spacetime tells matter how to move. The first exact solution to the Einstein field equation was published the same year that Einstein published the equation, by Karl Schwarzschild. It describes the curvature of spacetime in the vicinity of a spherically symmetric, electrically neutral, non-rotating mass. To obtain it, we want to insert the values of the energy-momentum tensor and solve for the metric. It's more convenient to use spherical coordinates for this, which for a flat empty space give us the following values for the metric. But when we insert the mass into the equation, the values change to these. This is called the Schwarzschild metric, and it predicts the existence of a singularity at the center of the mass when the radius hits the value 2 mg, the so-called Schwarzschild radius. The Schwarzschild radius, also known as the gravitational radius, is a physical parameter in the Schwarzschild solution to the Einstein field equation, and it can be calculated for any given mass. Its meaning is simple. If I take a mass and compress it down to and past its Schwarzschild radius, the gravitational field is going to become so strong, the curvature of space-time so large, that nothing, even light, cannot escape its pull. We would have effectively made a black hole. If nothing can escape a black hole, does that mean that black holes violate the law of conservation of information? 
Maybe they don't destroy the information, but they surely hide it very well. Hidden information is entropy, so that means that black holes must have an entropy. But we also know that they have an energy just by virtue of their mass. If black holes have an energy and an entropy, this means that they are subject to the laws of thermodynamics. They have a temperature and they emit a radiation spectrum. The radiation spectrum of a perfect black body. A body which absorbs all light. And the light that it emits is a function of its temperature. See, for an ordinary body which is not a black hole, as the temperature increases, the particles composing it begin to move faster. And because these particles have charge, they send ripples through the electromagnetic field. As the temperature increases, the frequency of the emitted light, which by the way is quantized into photons, also increases, and so the wavelengths of the individual photons get shorter. In the case of black holes, however, for wavelengths below the Schwarzschild radius, the photons are simply not emitted. The reason is that black holes are fundamentally different than ordinary objects. They emit something called Hawking radiation, named after Stephen Hawking. This is a type of thermal radiation due to the spontaneous creation of particle-antiparticle pairs in the vacuum right near the horizon. These pairs usually annihilate immediately, but now the black hole can suck one half in, while the other can escape to form Hawking radiation. In this peculiar way, the black hole can lose energy and eventually radiate its mass away. Hawking was in fact the first to calculate what the temperature of a black hole of mass m must be and he found the following equation. As you can see, the temperature of a black hole is inversely proportional to its mass. This means that bigger black holes are colder, extremely cold, while smaller black holes are way hotter. This effectively defines the zeroth law of thermodynamics for black holes. The first law is simple. It's just the fact that the energy of the infolding matter is equal to the energy of the emitted radiation. The second law, however, is where things get really interesting. Prior to Hawking's discoveries, Jacob Bekenstein first calculated what the entropy of a black hole should be. He considered how the second law would play out if an object with some entropy is thrown into the black hole. For the second law to not be violated, Bekenstein had to find a quantity which can only increase and increase accordingly as the object falls in. He discovered that this quantity the quantity to which the black hole entropy is proportional is the surface area of the black hole horizon. You would expect that the entropy of a system, the amount of hidden information, would be proportional to the entire volume of the system, but it turns out that this is not the case. Furthermore, it can be shown from this expression that the amount of information hidden within a black hole is directly correlated with the number of Planck area units which can fit inside the total area. Each Planck unit of area corresponds to one bit of information. Later, Bekenstein generalized the black hole entropy equation to something called the Bekenstein bound. The Bekenstein bound says that the entropy of any system is always less than or equal to the maximum entropy, which is the entropy of the system were it to become a black hole. This means that black holes attain the maximum possible entropy for a given system. They are what is called entropically saturated. Finally, we need to talk about the third law of thermodynamics for black holes. We already know that the temperature of a black hole is inversely proportional to its mass, which means that the temperature can approach but never reach absolute zero, because its mass would then be infinite. Now, we know that as the temperature approaches zero, the entropy approaches zero, but also doesn't reach it. This means that there should be a lower bound on the entropy of black holes, and for quantized microstates this entropy is equal to exactly one bit of information. What is most fruitful about black hole thermodynamics is that it's a place where both general relativity and quantum field theory meet, which means that this could potentially lead us to a unified theory of quantum gravity. For example, according to John Wheeler, at the Planck scale, due to quantum fluctuations, there should be enormous densities which fill the vacuum with microscopic black holes. The thermodynamics of this GR predicted black hole vacuum might somehow reproduce standard quantum mechanics. 
According to an independent researcher named J. Yablon, this might be the case. In a recent paper, he points out how the Bekenstein bound can be algebraically restructured to an entropically scaled variant of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And because we know that the entropy cannot reach zero, we know that the right side of this equation cannot reach zero, which is in accordance with the unvanishing uncertainty in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Another more popular approach is to generalize black hole entropy equation to something called the holographic principle. Initially formulated by Leonard Susskind and Gerard Hooft, the holographic principle postulates that the information of any material system enclosed within a given region can be fully described by the degrees of freedom which live on the boundary of that region. By applying this concept to the entire universe, we can effectively treat it as a hologram where the properties of the three-dimensional space are encoded in a lower-dimensional boundary. The holographic principle serves as a bridge between information theory and gravity, offering promising avenues for advancing our understanding of the fundamental nature of the universe, particularly in the elusive realm of quantum gravity. As researchers continue to delve into these fascinating concepts, we may inch closer to unraveling the mysteries that lie at the heart of black holes and the profound interplay between space, time and information.